What technique or techniques do you teach? So the, the main technique that I focus on is Fitzmaurice voice work. And that has four pillars to it, destructuring, restructuring, presence, and play. Primarily that's focused on the voice and uh, the voice coming from the body and the breath. And it draws on elements from somatic experiencing and bioenergetics, shiatsu and yoga, uh, to create a, a resonant open instrument and uh, to bring a really present actor to their work. Fantastic. Yeah. What else do you teach? I also teach buto, and, which is a form of dance that comes from Japan as well as organic intelligence, which is a type of therapy that teachers are finding really useful uh, in the acting world. Predominantly for me, why I became a Fitzmaurice voice work teacher was it was a game changer for me. Um, I have been a physical theater actor for many years. I started off training voice when I was nine and worked in like link later work and, and found a lot of value in that. And then for a while, my voice practice dropped off and I actually um, had a lot of tension in my voice and I was using my body in ways that weren't sustainable. And Fitzmaurice voice work came along when I was teaching, turning to teaching um, people who weren't even actors, but everybody had a trauma story and it would come out in their voice and in their body and in their uh, comfort being seen or heard. And I knew that I needed to teach them more than articulation and diction or loudness, but really about being able to be seen and being able to channel what they were feeling in a really authentic way and to use themselves in a way that was going to be sustainable so they, they weren't going to be injuring their voices. And so I um, found out about Fitzmaurice voice work and started to study it, and it changed my voice tremendously. I went from, when I get really emotional from people kind of pulling away like this, to people actually moving in and being drawn into uh, what I had to say. And the underlying premise for me is that when breath meets your body, and draws from you the authentic experience that you're having in the moment, and you're able to turn that into vibration, then other people respond to that, whether that's your scene partner or your audience, or it's coming through at another time through a recorded medium. Um, also really useful for voice actors, especially because they're doing a lot of often sitting or working in really um, restricted spaces. And so being able to support their voice so that they have a lot of variety and a lot of emotion when they need to and clarity uh, and an authentic sound that they're not trying trying to be something but as all actors are looking for that authentic moment of being um, felt and heard at the same time why does it matter why should an actor yes. study i love this question actors should study technique because technique creates a container that the actor then can fill with themselves. And it's useful to know the structure of the container because this is a job. We understand when we look at an, an athlete that if you're an NFL hopeful, you're not just waiting tables and not training and waiting for your NFL contract to come through. And yet, I have met so many people who are actors, but they don't have a practice. We are using our voices and our bodies and our emotions like athletes use their bodies. And so we need to be training and honing our musculature, our neurological system to be able to support our performance in the moment. It doesn't just magically happen. And that's really where technique and skill comes in. Ultimately, the goal is to, of course, be able to be so embodied in the work that you transcend it. You don't practice Meisner just to be good at repetition. You don't do push-ups just to be good at doing push-ups and then you throw out your back when you go to tie your shoelaces. But this work is um, dangerous if there isn't a structure and a safety net. At the end of the day, I need to be able to go in and deliver within the allotted time, working within the budget and everybody else's um, energy levels and timeframes. And then I need to be able to go home and I need to also have a practice that allows me to be healthy and to be able to switch between Frankie who is performing a character in the moment and then Frankie who can go home and engage with the world as myself. 
And it's really important to be able to have the ability to shift into the work as well as to come out of the work as well. Just that. The in and out of the work. This, this yeah. is my yeah. thesis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like for me, this is everything is that. Yeah. And in some ways, the technique. So in therapy, because I'm a trained occupational therapist. So part of my specialty is in mental health, um, neuro and chronic pain. So I use a lot of that in my teaching as well. And in therapy, at this point, the studies seem to show that, it, that the style of therapy that you're receiving doesn't matter as much as your, your relationship to your therapist. I, within reason, I'd argue that in a way that there is no one technique. I think that there's a, a danger in it becoming dogma or ritual and we don't actually know why we're doing those exercises anymore. I think the relationship between the, an acting student and their teacher is really important. And that's also why a teacher who is embodied and has their own practice and is able to, to walk their talk is um, incredibly invaluable to the learning process. And so I think that it's not a one thing of like, oh, only, only Meisner got it or only Adler got it or what have you. I think that everybody's scratching at the surface. Also, I think that all teachers are drawn to one particular element and then they, they've made their career around that, whether Meisner is about listening or whether it's about recalling emotion or living in imagination or uh, Fitzmaurice voice work, which is about using the body and drawing from the experience of what you're having in that moment and allowing the body to organize and support that. So that comes out in vibration, which is a physical wave that touches other people. Um, ultimately, it's, it's how, the, um, how it's taught, what works for the actor. I think that some actors just go nicely with what Meisner has to say or with what um, you know, how method works or what have you. So finding that lovely chemistry is important. But I do think it does come down to a teacher-student um, or teacher-actor relationship, ultimately. I think that there is no one technique. And I think there's value to studying different techniques. However, being able to sit with a technique long enough so that you actually are learning it and, and embodying it and really being able to, to get out of it what it has to give you is also important. Um, but I don't think it should ever be like, I'm going to do this for my entire life and nothing else is right or I can't gain anything from anything else. Question then. Uh, Please. You've already covered like most of everything I'm I know. <laughs> awesome. How long do you think it takes somebody to really embody Particular technique in general? First, it depends on the person. It, on one hand, it's a lifetime. For me personally, every time I go into tremoring, every time I'm playing with the destructuring and restructuring of Fitzmaurice's voice work, I learn something new. For me, it's like going to a well of like beautiful, clean water. And, and, it's, and just drinking from that well, and I encounter myself in a different way every time. Um, it, is a, it is a lifetime journey. That being said, I mean, my background is in a, university, in a university program, conservatory programs. I think that you at least have to commit to a year minimum. However, I would even say two or five years uh, it would be more realistic. And then the most important thing is if you do then stop as somebody who graduated from university program and then didn't do voice for about three years, it, it's not about downloading that information and going, that's now in me, I don't, have to, I don't have to work at it anymore. Again, it's like going to the gym constantly. It's a practice. And actors ultimately need to be able to build their own practice of what works for them and be able to keep themselves um, healthy and supported to be able to, something that fires up their imagination, their voice and their body. And if they're not actively in a training program at the time or taking classes, then they need to take on the responsibility of having a practice on their own and being able to keep that alive in their body. So again, an NFL player, they might be doing drills, they might be doing swimming, they might be doing ballet class. And that's not so they can do ballet on the field, it's so that when they're in the, in the game, their body is fired up, their um, reactions or their impulses are ready to go, and they don't have to think it through. It shouldn't feel like technique in the moment. 
because that technique is so embodied, there should be some automatic structuring that's going on. So on that analogy, yeah. I would imagine, and I'll see if you agree, that NFL players enjoy that stuff they do. Yes. Right. So if you're an actor and you don't enjoy training yourself, getting trained, being in class, that sort of thing, yeah. maybe not the trade for you. Why are you doing it? Absolutely. And, and this is another thing that really underpins the work I do is pleasure. And actors sometimes forget that this is ple pleasure and play. This work is playful. This work is joy. Yes, it's hard. And there's pleasure in that. Again, I, I'm a triathlete, so I use a lot of athletic metaphors in, in um, how I teach. And sometimes it's just showing up. And you don't have to feel inspired. You just show up and you do your practice. Other times you're going for a run and you're sweating and you're tired and your heart is racing. And you're like, this is amazing. I love this. And the same thing, you're working on a show. You get to work with people who light you up, who make you um, maybe desire to grow in a certain way, who inspire you, who support you. You get to see people being awesome at what they do. You get to feel your own breath and your own awesomeness in the moment, and you're serving the story. That should feel so joyful and so playful. And there's this, this um, shutting down that can happen or this rigidity that can happen, either because people are so uh, freaked out about technique that, and maybe it's because it's so new to them, that they're just trying to do the, you know, play the scales or what have you, or think of their feet. Um, but ultimately, it should feel like a flow through. And when you're in that flow and in that moment, and you're like, what if I say it this way? Can we do it again? What if I do this instead? It should feel good. And I think ultimately, it's easy to forget that, that this is a really great job but it is work, mm -hmm. and the work is what gets you into the joy. And what's, what's so crazy about acting is it is both, it's both difficult and also kind of easy. Like, we're supposed to just be people. Just, just be people. Yeah. Just do what you do. But, but the whole point, the reason that technique comes in is, well, I, I have to do what I do, but I have to do it within these confines. Like this is the stage, or here's the camera. Oh, and now they want me to angle it like this, and now our heads are really close together. But have a real emotion while that guy's picking his nose off off the off this camera, right? So, yeah. I mean, no, Meisner says it like you know imaginary circumstances, right? Like there's there's a lot of reality happening around you, but but stay focused, right? And so it's it's incredibly fake circumstances that you have to be doing, just be natural. Well, when you're on camera and you're suddenly thinking about your hands, you're suddenly like obsessed about, yeah, like what are hands? Ricky Bobby hands. What, what, what are hands? Like <laughs> what have I ever done with my hands? Or like what is breathing? Yeah. I've had, we all have those moments where like the things we never ever have thought about, suddenly we can't yeah. stop thinking about yeah. on camera, yeah. right? And so having, that's where again, that technique comes in because just be. Well, that's actually incredibly hard sometimes. Yep. And so finding that allowing, finding that pleasure. Also really importantly, um, because my work is about the autonomic nervous system, so being able to understand charge and stress and also um, how to, to discharge and how to be able to balance both your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system at the same time, because that's what presence looks like, we think according to the science, okay. is a little bit of both, right? So having to be able to work with charge when it shows up in a way that it doesn't hinder you, but actually helps you. Again, in sports, you see this with people who get like, they get, they get frozen, right? Or they get the yips or whatever, yeah. right? We, ha we have a similar experience. I was saying, you know, I, I'm, I was teaching a resilience and well-being class last month, and I was talking about how we're like the firefighters, right? Normal people run away from the burning building. We're running towards it. Yeah. And also having to have nuance and be expressive at the same time, right? It's terrifying what we do. Yeah. And so being able to understand how to work with that charge and terror in a way that it actually helps to further what you're doing or helps to bring more realism to that moment is, is an art, is a technique. And that's why the training is so important. Yeah. The other thing, like, the other thing, when I'm working, particularly when I'm working with actors who are preparing for an audition, 
what I, what I look for is that moment of, of like, they get lit up inside. And I think that that's also where technique is really useful. Because, okay, I got this side. Oh God, it's this character, right? It's this type. Mm -hmm. But then if we can find a way to sort of just bring something exciting to that moment in that scene, that is what the camera wants to see. The camera wants to see you breathe and tremble and the camera wants to see you light up. And that is where our technique comes in. Because anybody can read words off a script. Anyone can remember some lines and speak them. People do all the time, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a preacher, right? So what sets us aside from those other jobs is the ability to be so alive in the moment, so lit up, that other people start to feel maybe what we're feeling through a camera <laughs> or through, through a third wall or what have you. And that's, that's magic. And so we get to create something out of nothing. And I think that that's an incredible um, opportunity and incredible gift. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Actors in Atlanta will be better actors when there is more of a training culture here. That's something that, you know, when I go to New York, I mean, you've got people who go, on Mondays I go to voice class, on Tuesdays I go to scene study, on Wednesdays I go to movement class, then I see my therapist, you know, and, and then I fit in time to, to, to eat, sleep and work. And it's, it's such a, there's such a hunger there. I'm from Vancouver, it's the same thing. There's such a drive and a hunger there. And also a really healthy underground scene. So, you know, people aren't just doing, say, a scene study class or an on-camera acting class. They're doing buto classes. They're doing dance classes. They want, they want extra skills because they're able to take those in and embody them and then bring that to the next character. And they're always kind of looking for that thing to give them an edge. And I do find in Atlanta, you have either people who've come from that and have moved here. And so they, they have already had that momentum and then they maybe come here and feel like they don't know where to go or they're not sure how to keep going. Or you have people who are here who are like, this thing called an actor is great. I took a weekend class or I'm a background actor and, and that I know how set, like I know what life on the set's like. I don't have to do anything. And, and I would love to see more of a training culture here. I know my background is from like a conservatory program and a, and a university program, so I do have, a, have that kind of a bias. Here it's very a la carte. And while in some ways that's lovely, because I do know people who've graduated with master's degrees that they feel were completely useless in theater and they left feeling completely disempowered. Um, here, I think it's so far on the other side that we really risk, and this is already happening, where Atlanta is being looked down on or like, okay, yeah, we can get the background actors there and we can get the, you know, the day players or whatever. But when we really want a, like a great actor, we got to fly him in. And I want Atlanta to be on the map. And so we need to have what I would say is a training culture. We need to have a healthy underground culture, you know, where people can go last night I, I did Suzuki or last night I did what, you know, I did this weird show in a basement somewhere. There's nothing you can do that will scare me. <laughs> right. And in, in this commercial like Verizon, psh, I can do this. And then also, um, I want to see more professional isn't a paycheck. It's a behavior. And I do have to say as someone who runs a theater company and who teaches, my interactions are very telling with students in terms of how they communicate. And there's some who are very responsive and, and who know how to manage their time and show up on time. Um, and then there's people who blow off in-person auditions or, you know, or people who talk to me like they're chatting to their buddy on Facebook. And um, your relationship with your agent, with a casting director, with anyone starts from the first moment they've even heard about you. And so if it's that email that you sent because they were holding a workshop and you were like, hey, I want to audit your workshop. You know, that might be the, the, the impression that they get of you. And then they, you want to come and audition for them later or build a relationship with them later. And they might go, I'm really stuck on this first interaction we had, right? So just like the show begins when it starts being advertised and people start to be aware of it your interaction with everybody in the industry is like the, that first conversation or that first message that goes on. So they may never even get to look at your showreel. 
And I do think that there's a value in Atlanta to people just kind of stepping it up a little bit in terms of awareness of how to act, to behave professionally, that that's what happens before anyone gives you a paycheck or gives you the big job. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's also just a healthy dose of, I do think that the fake it before you make it thing has led to an overcorrection. Yeah. And like you actually have to be offering the agent you're applying to or the casting director you want to notice you, you actually have to offer them substance. Yeah. You know, and so this is where technique comes in because you actually have stuff to give them before you worry about like, I got a snazzy headshot and, and I can walk in like I'm the big swing and whatever. You know, I live the big star. It's like, no, you actually have to be able to deliver because this casting director wants a sure thing. Money is tight, time is tight. There are thousands of people who can do your job. There are thousands of people who look like you. Like, this is one thing I noticed in Vancouver. You go into an audition and you're like, there's people who look more like me than me, <laughs> right? And so what is it that I bring that is going to bring me the job or put me over the edge or build a relationship where they keep calling me back and they go, this person's really awesome to work with. What's, what's your guilty pleasure or a guilty pleasure that you have? <sighs> Well, for the one that's, because we're recording it, I have to be careful which one I share. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are recording this. Oh my goodness. I, I really, well, I'll, I'll go with food. I really love spicy food. I'm a vegan, but I joke I like my food to bite back. <laughs> so I like my curries to be spicy. I like lots of wasabi on my sushi. It's got to have, it's, it's got to hurt a little bit. <laughs> Do you feel guilty about having really spicy food? Only if someone else wants to try and eat it, I might feel a little bit guilty. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> I'm not going to get too personal.